All right. Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, there is a misdescription in the uh, dis in the description of me in the, the stuff that came out of it. I'm not an expert in any way, shape, or form. I'm a marine engineer, which means I'm a generalist. Uh, my background is at sea. I started off at sea. Uh, I then came ashore into, into management. Um, I've done a variety of different jobs, fleet manager, run vetting organisations, I've bought ships, and I've, uh, I've done a, a whole lot of things, including my first job when I came ashore, which was an HSE. Uh, I was the uh, fleet, safe, uh, fleet safety manager when I, in my sort of first role when I came ashore. After I'd finished that job, I vowed I would never go, go and do an HSE job again. Until 20 years later, when I was told by our chief executive he wanted me to head up HSE, to which I said, yes, sir. <laughs> um, so, uh, a bit of a hypocrite, but there you are. Uh, I, I, I left uh, BP about uh, nine years ago. Uh, I run a small consulting company. I chair IMRS Human Element Working Group. Um, and I also sit on a thing called the Human Element Industry Group, which is a, is a group of NGOs that have uh, clubbed together at IMO to try and make a difference. Uh, to uh, the human element, and uh, I think it was a comment earlier that ILO and IMO getting together and talking to each other. One of the great things that we have on our uh, on our group is we have the International Chamber of Shipping, and we have the International Transport Workers Federation on the same group, uh, and they have uh, they have both said we've got lots of places we can disagree. Let's let's agree on stuff here. Now I'm going to be slightly controversial here. I'm not going to start off with an outline. I'm going to start off with some questions. But those questions are going to be based on the, on, the, on the words of the great prophet, Jimmy Cliff. There are more questions than answers. Uh, first question is, why don't, they all, they all do what they're, why don't they do what they're told? Quite often we, have, we hear people talking about seafarers and saying, why don't they do what they are told? Now, what does that tell you about culture? We'll come back to that question later. Um, seafarers, are they hazards or heroes? Uh, another question that we need to think about when we, when we talk about culture. No blame culture. We did that years ago, didn't we? I was talking to, to Gary at the break there. We, we have recollections of doing things to do with cultures of 15, 20 years ago. Um, have you got a culture now? Has your organisation got a culture now? Is it a culture or is it culture? Is there more than one culture? Um, and is it about leadership or management? And the final question, what is the meaning of life? <laughs> now, um, yeah, we've got 30 minutes to discuss this. <laughs> So we should, be, we should be able to get to that one. It's all right, I know it's 15 minutes, I'll set my timer. <laughs> yep, it's working. Okay, first of all, the problem. What, what is it, we're, what is it we, we are concerned about? We, if we're interested in a safety culture, what's in our mind? And th this is um, a quote from a person called Scott Sagan in a book called The Limits of Safety, which is definitely worth reading. It, he says, things that have never happened before happen every day. It's a very interesting book because it's about safety of the American nuclear weapons industry. Uh, and, and he did a very interesting comparison in it between high reliability organizations and what's called normal accident theory. The normal accident theory is stuff happens. High reliability organizations is everything can be avoided. He started off talking about high, rel high rel reliability organizations and by the end of his, uh, his book and the end of his study, he'd come to the conclusion that a nuclear weapons accident was inevitable. And the only thing that had stopped was the Cold War had ended and people had stopped, stopped threatening each, each other with nuclear weapons. Doesn't that make us feel good about today? Um, this is Shaw's corollary to Scott Sagan's uh, comment. In the marine industry, things that have happened before happen every day in different ways. So the, the ultimate conclusions are we, we sink, we explode, we ground, we collide, we do a whole bunch of things. They're, they're, they're the same uh, hazards that have been at sea for the last God knows how many years. But we're finding different ways of doing it. So if you think about the, the, the American Arleigh Buck uh, destroyers, the most sophisticated destroyers and the, the, the most sophisticated vessels in the, in the world, well-trained, well-manned people on board. And there have been two collisions uh, where they've hit other, other vessels because of a whole bunch of things like stealth technology and all the rest of that. So you know things are happening in different ways now, which is, which is worth thinking about. And someone is to blame. Is someone to blame? That's a good question. I just realised something. Uh, <laughs> let's start off with the question about seafarers being hazard or heal. So, if a seafarer is a hazard, that, that works on the, pro the, the principle that ships are correctly designed, they're reliable, no flaws, everything's absolutely great. Management systems are 
read, they reflect the, the operating environment perfectly. And the only problem is a whole bunch of stupid people in ships just won't be able to talk. Um, and focusing on those errors that they, they make will prevent incidents. Now, this is a thing called workers' imaginings. I don't know if anyone's read it. A book called Safety One and Safety Two by um, Eric Holmack. Um, and workers imagined is, is I think, reflects the, the, the discussions about uh, the safety climate survey and all the rest of that. You have people at the top of the organisation who have a, a view as to what the organisation is like and what its flaws are. Um, and work, workers imagine tends to tends to sort of permeate the upper layers of an organisation, regulators and, and, and likes of that. So, is a seafarer hazard or is he a hero? Um, so ships contain errors, compromises, and specification, you know, design flaws, and all the rest of that sort of stuff. Um, management systems contain errors, and the only way that ships operate at all is because of those people on board who are actually, in my view, are, are the heroes. And if you focus on what was right, then you've actually got a chance of, of making things better. And that, that, is, that takes you to what is described as work has actually done the safety to sort of, you know, description. Um, a lot of discussion about football this week. Um, I'm a Scotsman, but I do still feel the pain for, for, for the Indian women's team uh, um, getting knocked out of the, the World Cup. But if you take a football analogy, and you, you start off with, um, you've got a goalkeeper there, and um, you, your team loses 5-0. Do you sack the goalkeeper? Do you get rid of the goalkeeper? Now, in the, in the world of, of the human as hazard, that's, that's what you would do. But realistically, the next question you'd, ask, you'd have to ask is, well, actually, how many goals did they save? And if they saved 50 goals um, and only let five in, that might actually be a pretty good performance. And it actually might be that it's the other 10 people in the pitch that are the problem. And the other 10 people in the pitch didn't put a ball in the, in the other person's head, and they didn't provide much help um, for the goalkeeper. So the seafarer is a goalkeeper. Um, how do you get the other 10 people in the pitch, the people who design ships, build ships, design equipment, do all the rest of that sort of stuff? How do you get management companies to make sure they've got the right processes and procedures in place and all the rest of that sort of stuff? So I'm firmly in the, in the, in the hero camp here. Um, and, and getting people to do greater and greater things, and this is a lovely quote from um, James Reason. Um, other authors are, are available, but James Reason, as, as you all know, um, wrote, the, wrote the book Human Error, which is, has had so much focus over the years, and recently wrote a book called The Human Contribution, which I think is an absolutely brilliant book. Uh, and his summary is there, after studying human unsafe acts within hazardous enterprises for more than three decades, I have to confess that I find the heroic recoveries of much greater interest. And in the long run, I believe potentially more to the pursuit of, uh, more, more to the pursuit of improved safety in dangerous operations. And I think that's a very important point to remember. And I just need to keep forgetting, keep forgetting about that guy on board being a hazard. He's actually here, and how did we help him? Um, is culture new? Uh, again, Gary and I had a brief discussion about that earlier. Uh, Safety culture in the, in the shipping industry in the 1990s, I remember very clearly talking about no blame culture, I remember talking about the learning culture, reporting culture. In the 2000s, um, I remember as adopting a, a, a just culture, it was there, it was developing and we saw some, you know, in the organisation that I was in, we saw some, some great leadership. Um, we had a chief executive, for example, whose, whose philosophy was, if there was ever a, a, a days away from work accident and um, uh, on a ship, he and his wife would go out and see him, see the person who had been injured. Now, I don't know if that was a threat, that might have been a threat, mm -hmm. but, but he, you know, there, there were some quite surprised people who suddenly found a, a chief executive um, flying in at short notice and standing beside the, uh, the hospital bed and asking how they were and, 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 um, and that sort of stuff. And that, to me, is, is, good, um, is, is good leadership. If it was there then, what's happened to it? And that's, that's the bit that's worrying me. The, the, the question here isn't, can we create a safety culture in the, in the shipping industry? It's, it's out there somewhere, what's happened to it? Some things have changed. Clearly there's a diverse multi uh, multinational workforce, and that is an issue, an issue because different cultures deal, deal with things in different ways. In the early 2000s, we refocused a, a lot of our attention on things like environment, security, piracy, and took our mind off that, that, that particular issue. I believe that one of the issues is incentives, punishment, and in, and inappropriate KPIs. People are being motivated to do, to do the wrong thing. I had a professor when I, when I did a, when I was a business school at Cranfield who said, if you give a, people, if you give a person a bonus um, based on a KPI, don't be surprised if they get the bonus, don't be surprised how they do it as well. 
people will always make the, make the bonus targets, but whether you achieve what you want, that's another issue at all. Um, workload and the volume of data inhibits, inhibits learning. There's just so much stuff out there. How can you have a learning culture if, uh, if people have got to deal with this uh, fire hose of, of, of stuff that keeps coming toward them? And, um, and safety reporting and analysis, I believe, this stopped at human error. I think the moment somebody's got to human error, they say, oh, well, now we know the problem. Um, because we know that the only humans in the shipping industry are seafarers. There are no other humans in the shipping industry. And if there are no, no other humans in the, in the shipping industry, none of them can obviously make errors. So the people who design ships can't be humans because they don't make errors. The people who create management systems don't make errors, you know, all that sort of stuff. So there is a thing about, it's not human error we're talking about, it's a seafarer. It's only the seafarer that makes errors, not anybody else. Uh, so there is this bias to blame. There is something built into the, the insurance side of things, which is, which is that um, quite often the ship owner is insured against the wrongs of the seafarer. Um, however, uh, if, if it's his management system that's found at fault, then you can breach uh, limitations of liability and all the rest of that sort of stuff. So, so there's, there's a bit of, is the seafarer expected to take one for the team? Because if you do that, then the insurance pays out and, and so forth. Seafarers, um, the criminalization of seafarers, so if you have an accident or an incident, there is this uh, understanding that it's going to be very difficult to get hold of the ship owner, so lock up the seafarer until you've got somebody that you can, you can uh, hold to account for. So not good at creating a reporting culture, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, um, it, and it's not, it's not good for, for learning as well. Um, again, other, other people are available. Jane's reason does make the point there rather eloquently that, uh, that it's not the person in the front line. That, um, that's causing all this, it's all the stuff behind them, I won't read that out, because that will run to 30 minutes. And also, I think um, we should also learn from what the UK CEA say. They say human error alone is still often seen as the sole explanation for aviation accidents. Um, and the, the rest of the story is, we've got to think a bit wider, and it is interesting that the Boeing 737 um, issue recently, that actually the focus has been on a manufacturer rather than being on the on the actual pilots of the aircraft. If we could start pointing the finger at people who are putting dodgy equipment aboard ships, um, then it would help the seafarer a lot. You, you can see I have a slight bias here. You probably <laughs> realise that. Um, which culture? culture? No, you've seen this one before. The safety culture of an organisation is a product. I'm going to read it again. But does an organisation only have a, a, a safety culture? And this is where the, the problem, I think, lies. So this is the Chartered Management Institute's, Institute's um, definition of organizational culture. The simple fact is the safety culture is part of the organizational culture. The organization um, has its culture and you can't just expect people to select safety culture in their brain when they're dealing with one thing and you know select organization culture when they're dealing with another thing. So, so how do you integrate the safety culture into an organization? And that, that to me is, is important. Safety culture does not sit alone. Um, Again, James Reason, I love James Reason. I have read lots of books since, but I do love James Reason. And this is a really brilliant um, picture that he put in, the, in his book, uh, Managing the Risks of Organizational Accidents. Um, what it's trying to say is, this is the old performance protection bit. The horizontal axis is you're trying to improve the performance of your organization. The vertical axis is you're trying to improve, improve the protection. And the shipping company, or any company, has to deal with um, with finding a balance between making themselves bankrupt or, or, or facing catastrophe, either of which will destroy their, their organizations. And there is absolutely nothing to be gained by driving quality companies out of business. That won't make the seas any safer. So we have to, we have to accept that, that we have to run ships uh, in, a, in a sensible economic way, um, but at the same time not in a dangerous way. And that, that to me is a very important um, uh, graphic um, he, it's, a, it's also dynamic. Uh, James Reason also talks, in, talks about a thing called the unrocked boat. The unrocked boat is, if nothing has gone wrong for a, a, a long period of time, then you can head towards that catastrophe bit because you start trimming costs, you start, start cutting costs back. And before you know where you are, you've taken yourself into the, the drift into failure, as, as it's been described. Um, this is a, a picture of the tanker industry, which just illustrates the same thing. Uh, the, Slides have been a wee better idea, but never mind. Uh, just to point out that you know when you go to low freight rate, you know the, the 
possibility for bankruptcy is getting higher and higher, um, and um, uh, and your options get less and less. But you know, it's a dynamic situation. We move within that safe prop profitable operation area, and the red lines move as well. Um, how does it feel to be aboard ship? How are we doing? Not very well. Um, <laughs> but how does it feel to be aboard ship? Um, and, and th this is a picture I've, I've used a lot. I'm sure people have... Oops, so there's it. Um, and you can see what it's like to be aboard ship. You're having to deal with conflicting goals. You're having to deal with conflicting requirements. There's lots of communications, lots of systems. How does all of that help you to, to, to develop a safety culture? There's all sorts of different messages coming from different places. Um, I'm going to flip that because I think we've all talked about that already. Um, and, and focus on the punch the punchline here, which is, I believe it's about leadership. And this is a this is an excellent model, and it's got nothing to do with James Reese. It's a guy called Stephen Mungie, uh, who wrote a book called The Art of Action. And the point out of this the point out of this book is there are three bits um, to being a leader. One is about direction. You've got to set the direction of the organization. Another one is about leading, which is about motivating people to do things, creating culture, and all the rest of that. And another one is about managing. And managing is, is, is about resourcing, organizing, controlling, performance, and all the rest of that sort of stuff. Culture comes from leadership. It doesn't come from all the management stuff. And that, that's, to me, is, a, is an important point. You can't manage people into having the right culture. You've got to lead them to, they've got to know the direction, and they've got to, to be prepared to, to follow. Um, leadership. Set the direction. If you don't know where you're going, how can anyone else? I mean, that's a pretty fundamental piece of leadership which many, many people miss. Resolve conflicts before they, they, they reach the ships. All those goal came conflicts I was talking about before. Why don't you resolve them in the office? Why don't you explain to people how they should resolve them instead of them having to make a decision in the moment as to exactly how they balance security against piracy, against the environment, against safety, against cost? Um, Leave the seafarer with a minimum residual risk to manage, which is, is the same thing, which says get as much of it out of the way before it hits the ship. You, you solve the problems with the equipment, procedures and all that before it hits the ship and, and leave the person on board to do the minimum that they have to. And set an example. This is the most important thing. If you want leadership, you've got to show leadership. If you want a learning cu culture, you as an individual have got to, to show that you can learn, listen and take action. Um, you've got to give the same message in every context, and this was one, I, one thing I learned many years ago when I visited three ships, uh, three sister ships um, in one port. And um, it was very clear that uh, by the time I got to the third uh, ship, the first and second ships had already communicated what I'd been seeing, and they were tripping me up all over the place. Uh, so learn very quickly that, that when you're talking about safety, it's dead easy to talk about safety. But when you're talking about budgets, you could completely undermine the safety message because you've kind of forgotten. So, you know, same message in every context. context. If you want honest reporting, you've got to be honest as well in the report. And if you and you should leave the blame, blame out. You should focus on a, on a, on a just, just culture. Culture is about leadership, not management. I'm going to flip through this. This is only there to show you how complicated management is aboard ships. On the left-hand side, you've got the, the sharp end, the work is done. On the right-hand side, you've got um, work as imagined. But you know all that stuff doesn't help you to create a, a really good management culture. Um, I'm probably not going to spend too much time on complex adaptive systems again because I'm, I'm conscious that we're running out of time and I'm running out of time. Um, complex adaptive systems are a complex subject. It's, there's a lot of discussion about it at the moment. One of the one of the examples that you hear is insects, ants, and all the rest of that, and how ants can optimize their position and get food and, 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 and find food and bring it back. Uh, the features of complex adaptive systems are you've got competition for scarce, scarce resources. It's an open system, lots of things can influence it. Um, there are large numbers of in interactions, and the agents, i.e. the people in it, um, can be influenced by history and feedback, i.e. they can learn. And they can adapt to improve <coughs> performance. And we have seen um, in, um, in the financial industry how preferred incentives can get people to, uh, to do surprising things. And one of the issues about the, you know, the financial crash is had the financial system turned into a complex adaptive system and, and where the traders within it op optimizing their own position at the expense of everybody else? I think the answer is yes. The question is how complex is our, is our, our life at sea? How complex is life for seafarers? And the answer is it's becoming more complex. And if you look at our industry, 
this is a relatively simple, straightforward industry. We've got iron ore, we've got flag states, we've got you know, class societies, we've got the ship owners. Yes, that's all pretty, pretty standard stuff. Really, isn't it? This is this model is built around the tanker industry. Then you add on the on the fact that you've got hundreds of flag states, um, you've got loads of class organisations, and you've got loads of ship owners, all of which can interpret things in different ways. Now, that system that we have there was a system that existed in the 70s and 80s, uh, and we remember the horrible pictures of tankers um, uh, spilling oil all over the seas in, in that sort of period of time. I was a tanker officer at that time. Um, I used to tell people I was a piano player in a bordello rather than that. I was a seafarer uh, on tankers because it was just such an unfortunate reputation for you to have. Um, port states appeared in that point. Coastal states got absolutely tired of the fact that somebody's ship would come along and dump oil on the coast um, and they, the, the port states would have to, the coastal states would have to, to um, clean up the mess. So they created a thing called um, port state, port state control. Um, port state control optimised its position by, by creating memorandums of understanding, which allowed them to bully flags of class um, and to get them to do what they wanted. The oil companies created um, vetting organisations, and then the, the traders in the middle of it were demanding that credit uh, vetting organisations and and the likes of that um, uh, provide the right, the right assurance for them. So it's complex. That only talks about the safety side of things. It doesn't talk about it doesn't talk about the environment because if you built that into it, you just have a big blank black map back after this. Go over to the International Chamber of Shipping to talk to somebody about could we draw a bigger graphic of this? Um, answers. Right. I'm sorry about that. I'm, I'm a couple of minutes late. Let me just start off with the answers. First of all. I'm using emojis here. I, I, I should say that it's, I've been warned that when you're over 60, using emojis is dangerous <laughs> uh, because the emojis may mean something that you don't fully understand. So please understand that. Um, hopefully a football is all right. Um, but um, first question, uh, why don't they do what, we, what, what they ask, uh, what they're told? Um, and my, quest, my, my answer to that would be, don't blame the goalkeeper. The answer is, they're the guys who are stopping it going wrong. And one of the things I remember as a fleet manager um, is the number of times that the people aboard ship saved my bacon um, by, by taking the right action at the right time to stop something going horribly wrong. So, you know, first of all, don't blame the goalkeeper because they're, they're actually your best friend. Um, the seafarer, hazard or hero? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely with them being a, being a hero, uh, and, and our job is to help for heroes, and that wasn't. That wasn't the, uh, never mind. <laughs> Don't know what that box means. I hope it's not anything rude. Um, no blame culture. We did that years ago. Um, yeah, we did, but we seem to have lost it along the way, which is, which is kind of interesting. And that's, again, I hope that emoji is okay. Um, have you got a culture now? The answer is yes. And the, the point is, whether you like it or not, you've got a culture. Um, that culture may have been created accidentally, or it may be real, but you've got one. So, Suck it up, it's yours, and you better, you better live with it or change it. Um, safety culture must link with organization culture. Again, I'd go back to what I said earlier. It's an organization. It's a big, living, breathing mass of, 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 of uh, interactions. And it all has to fit together, otherwise you'll end up losing the, the plot very quickly. Um, good leadership creates the right culture. Bad, bad management destroys culture, I would, I would say, is, a, is, a, is an important point. It's, this is about the leadership. Um, and, um, and I know you've been waiting for the answer to the last one, and the answer is it's work in progress. <laughs> Sorry, folks. Um, but I will say one, one final thing, which, uh, which I think is, is worth mentioning, and that is KISS. Keep it simple for seafarers. If we make, it, we make all this stuff complicated, then it's not going to get down to the person who's actually got to deal with it. So KISS, make it. There's a parade. <laughs> no bagpipes. <laughs> they were, they, the bagpipes are due in a bit. Anyway. Um, Thank you very much. <laughs>